Hello, everybody. My name is Stepan Wood. I'm the director of the Center for Law and the Environment at the Allard School of Law uh, in the Br University of British Columbia. Uh, welcome to our third webinar in the series of webinars on uh, towards legal recognition for non-human relations. This webinar addresses non-human species and legal protection and recognition for them. Uh, I will just very briefly uh, welcome everybody on behalf of the Center for Law and the Environment, as well as the University Sustainability Initiative here at UBC and the Center for Democratic and Environmental Rights in Spokane, Washington, the co-sponsors of this event. The Center for Law and the Environment and UBC's Vancouver campus are located on the trad traditional ancestral and unceded territory of the Musqueam Nation. And uh, I invite everybody to reflect on the significance of that fact uh, for our meeting today and also to reflect on um, the traditional owners and stewards of the territory uh, on which you happen to be sitting today and joining uh, us in this webinar. Uh, the webinar is going to be moderated by my colleague, uh, Robert Clifford, who is Wasanich and a member of the Tsawut First Nation. Uh, Robert, or Yelkwetsa, uh, is a colleague of mine at the law school who is doing fantastic and important work on uh, revitalization of Wasanich and other Indigenous laws through research and land-based learning. I'm going to hand it over now to Robert. Uh, the webinar is being recorded for your future reference, uh, and uh, so you'll be able to watch the uh, recording on our website and YouTube channel. But uh, right now, I'll hand it over to Robert to introduce our topic and our panelists uh, for today. Thanks very much, Robert. And thank you, Stepan. Uh, so to begin with, I'm joining from Husseinich territory today. Uh, in Husseinich, we have creation stories that speak of the land, the water, and all other non-human relatives as ancestors. And likewise, we have laws and responsibilities that speak to what it means to be in good relationship with those beings and those relatives. And these teachings have always been something very near and dear to my heart personally. So I wanted to start by raising my hands to uh, all three of our presenters today and the important work that you're all doing. Um, I'm very honored to be here and to, to have the chance to introduce our respected guests. Um, I'll introduce each before their turn to speak. And in terms of our, our questions, I'll keep it fairly brief, but in terms of our questions, we'll get to those at the end. And if everyone could please use the Q&A function, uh, we'll keep the chat for kind of interactions or, or comments or so forth, but we'll only be watching for the Q&A for questions. And if there is a question you like, uh, please feel free to upvote or else we'll just uh, get to them in the order that they're presented. So um, with all of that, said. Uh, very happy again to introduce our three speakers. We'll be beginning first with Frank Bibo. Um, Frank is a member of the Minnesota Chippewa tribe, uh, pillager band, enrolled at White Earth Chippewa Reservation and living on Leech Lake Chippewa Reservation in Ball Club, Minnesota. Frank has worked as an attorney in a variety of contexts, including as an, an attorney for Honor the Earth, an Indigenous-led nonprofit environmental protection group directed by Winona Leduc and based on the White Earth Reservation. Frank has also worked with the Community Environmental Legal Defense Fund to develop the White Earth Band's Rights of Menomen Ordinance, Ordinance, which recognizes and protects the rights of Menomen or wild rice to exist, flourish, regenerate, and evolve and the inherent rights to restoration, recovery, and preservation. So building on that work, Frank is uh, the plaintiff's attorney in a lawsuit brought by Menumen Wild Rice as lead plaintiff, along with the White Earth Band and several tribal members in the White Earth Nation Tribal Court, aimed at halting the proposed Enbridge Line 3 replacement pipeline passing through Minnesota. 
So this is the first lawsuit brought in a tribal court to enforce the rights of nature and the first rights of nature lawsuit brought to enforce treaty rights. So I'm sure we will hear more about the special cultural and environmental significance of wild rice as to Chippewa. Uh, but with that, uh, I'll pass it over to you, Frank, and uh, thank you for being here with us today to share your knowledge. Oh, you're on mute there still. Miigwech, Robert. Um, very much like you were talking about, there's a lot of cultural aspects to what our roles are um, with regards to the plants and the animals and the, the birds and the fish and everything. I mean, we have a relationship with everything. And so wild rice in particular is the most important thing for us culturally. And, and magically enough, and I use that word magically because, you know, law, who knows what to say about law. We'll just say magically. Wild rice appears in the 1837 treaty specifically. And having those two words in a treaty with the United States as a federally recognized tribe, that's, that's about as high as you can get for some kind of legal recognition sort, short of the United States Supreme Court, I suppose. Um, so that's a good place to start. I feel very good about that. Monoman has watched out for us for a long time. We're supposed to watch out for Monoman as you were talking about with the relationships and, and the, the almost like a symbiotic relationship, because even the way we harvest causes a better reseeding of the, the wild rice in the water and things like that. It gets us out there actually involved. So we see what's happening in the environment. Being attached to wild rice probably um, might still be the most important. rice in the fall. So I'm, I'm connected to talk to people about the rights of Monoman. I don't have to explain it to a single tribal member, just that they know that the law exists when they hear it, they can describe to you what it's about without even having read the words, because it is culturally based. And we understand what we're doing just by following through with this litigation. It is very interesting how it's working right now with um, being in tribal court and using a tribal law and the state of uh, Minnesota resisting very strenuously, hoping not to have to actually uh, be subject to our jurisdiction. And, you know, I know that I'm, you know, talking with a law school and talking on several purposes, but it's really interesting when you've been left out, essentially, I mean, from the time the Constitution was created and there was treaties for the supreme law of the land and Congress deals with Indians and Indians not taxed. I mean, we were set off to the side and we have a different pathway than regular federal law. And, and so because of that, and because, because of, you know, the same thing that happens everywhere with oppression or whatever, our tribal courts here are 25 years old. So we don't have any case law against what I'm trying to do, which is always helpful. And because we've been left out in a big sense with tribal courts across the United States and the U.S. Constitution, there isn't any case law in federal law trying to say, I can't do what I'm doing. That's what really is a tough thing to learn is what isn't being said the white on the pages instead of the black ink. And so as I look through what I'm doing here, um, Monoman and tribal law is in a place where the 11th Amendment is mostly what the state has been trying to rely on, which says citizens of the state, one state can't sue another state and they can't sue their own state, basically. Well, we weren't citizens under that document. We weren't citizens under the Constitution. And so because we were set aside, like I was saying in the beginning, everything that follows afterwards really doesn't apply to us unless it's specific. And we'll talk about that in a second here, too. So the first 10 amendments don't apply to us, to the U.S. Constitution, because they came a minute after the Constitution was adopted. And the Constitution says us Indians are over here. So we don't get the benefit of those 10 amendments. The same thing happened with the 11th. The same thing happened all the way up to the 14th for equal protection until it says, and Indians not taxed, again, specifically. And so what you're talking about there is the Indian Commerce Clause. And so basically it's assumed by, by the world maybe that Congress knows there's Indians because it says so in the constitution and that when they wanna deal with Indians specifically, they're gonna say Indians. And if they wanna deal with a specific Indian tribe, they're gonna say, say that specific Indian tribe's name. 
It's not going to be a mystery when they deal with Indians. And so what we've discovered is with some of our treaty rights work, and, and a friend of mine, and I'll, I'll talk about him a little bit out in Washington State, is that because of those concepts and what our treaty rights are in terms of time and predating certain concepts, they couldn't apply the Lacey Act to us for fishermen who were taking fish off reservation, selling them off reservation to non-Indians who were putting them on the walls or eating them or whatever, because our treaty rights supersede and precede the Lacey Act. And our treaty rights are presumed that if they were going to impact our treaty rights under the Malak decision and so forth, which spells it out um, for us, particularly in 2000, <clears throat> treaties are <clears throat> treaties are to be understood the way the Indians would have understood them at the time. If there's any change or abrogations, it can only be done by Congress. Congress has to explain why they think they need to change or modify our treaty rights to accomplish whatever goal they think is important. And then finally, they have to compensate us for that taking. And so there's a whole big process about how you get past our treaty rights in that sense. And so it didn't work with the Lacey Act. And so there's a case out there that we use a lot called US v. Brown. It's got other fishermen in it. We call it the square hook case. And, and that's caught a lot of um, attention by itself. So that was in 2013. And then in 2015, the Eighth Circuit Court of Appeals upheld that. And they said, the same thing that we understood at the time of our treaties that we're allowed to hunt, fish, trap, and gather. And those materials that we get, we can use for clothing, food, and sale. Sale is a commercial purpose. We still have the rights to commercially harvest the animals and plants and everything else and sell it without taxation. And that's against the state, but I also believe it's against the federal government. And because, because of the stuff that I've been working on, I'm... I'm already in U.S. tax court because I don't think there are things I can be taxed for, even though I'm a U.S. citizen, I'm also a citizen of the tribe. And so if I'm an election judge, that doesn't have anything to do with the United States. That's the other side of the treaty. You know, so I don't think they can tax me even at the federal level. When I'm defending our environment against line three and things like that, that's part of our treaty rights. That's separate and apart from the United States. In that Brown decision, they talked about our rights to hunt, fish, and gather being exclusive from the state of Minnesota and from the federal government. And so that's a different circumstance. And you guys are in Vancouver, right? Yeah? Okay. So over in Vancouver, you're just north of Washington. So what happens is there's a whole bunch of treaties over there. They call them Hellgates treaties, Columbia River treaties. They got different nicknames for them. A lot of the most popular years for treaties are 1854, 1855. Because the resources were so um, scarce, I'll, I'll just use that, the water resources for fishing in Washington, and tribes have been pushed to the coast and different kinds of things. The treaties out there talk about the Indians having their rights to fish in the customary and usual places with the citizens of the territory or the citizens of the United States, because those weren't states yet, just like Minnesota wasn't a state yet. And so that meant that white people or non-Indians had a treaty right in 1855, the same as the Indians, because it said in common with the citizens of the territory or the United States. Our treaties aren't like that. And we had to explain that to the federal judges um, with that U.S. v. Brown and other cases because of the way our treaties are worded and our territory so vast and the way we were entrepreneurs and dealing with the United States, they realized that we were one tribe and they needed to deal with us in that fashion or they were going to not have control of the, the economy of uh, negotiations. And so what they said was after the 37 treaty, which is what the Malak decision is about with the uh, U.S. Supreme Court in 1842, it says all of the lands that have been ceded and all of the lands that are yet to be ceded are held in common by the Chippewa of the Mississippi and the Chippewa of Lake Superior. And so that means under property law concepts, the United States was not a party in that property relationship. And that's why our rights are exclusive from the United States. And the court said that Congress can change that. But that means you got to get Congress to agree and do something together. I'm not afraid of that. You know, so so those are kind of the baseline. And so if you have a commercial right 
that means you have a right to earn a modest living and, and earn other kinds of money. And so those are, that's part of what I'm looking at. The rights of monoman is, is something that we've all done one time in our life, trying to make a living, going out and picking wild rice, selling wild rice, whatever you do. So we've been intrinsically and, and extrinsically tied um, to monoman. And we've, 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 we've suffered many different things along the way. You got weather, you got economy, but then you had people who started um, farming it and it's paddy rice, but they don't want to call it farmed or paddy rice because there's no romance in that. But if you call it wild rice, people will buy it just like the Indians made it and it destroyed our economy for a long time. And so, you know, we've, we've had to resist different things along the way. A um, hundred years ago, we had to have Congress set aside a lake for us because one of the problems we had with our wild rice lakes was the the non-Indian farmers had figured out how to make floating combines and would go out and harvest so efficiently that the lakes didn't have enough seed to reseed itself naturally. Canada still airboats wild rice um, up north up here in the Great Lakes and they seed you know wild rice up there and so forth. And you know the words wild rice those those that's an English term, you know. So they, I guess they can call whatever they want wild. I don't know, but it's not monoman. It's not what we do. And, and so, you know, I met up with uh, Tom Lindsay and uh, Mari Magrill, and they're working with the Center for Environmental Democratic Rights or De Democratic Environmental Rights right now. And, you know, it became apparent to me that the tools that they had would work in tribal settings using our jurisdiction better than trying to figure out kind of how to use the tools the way that we first encountered them when we met. And, you know, that's what happens sometimes is you don't know what you got till somebody else looks at it and says, well, you got that painting hung upside down. You got to turn it again, you know, and, and so you've got it, you've got it put together. You just weren't looking at the puzzle maybe correctly. And maybe I'm still learning too. But what I know is that tribal law in a tribal jurisdiction, I don't think can be stopped against the state. And I don't think it can be stopped. At least when I say a state, I'm talking about their environmental groups. In Minnesota, that's the Department of Natural Resources, and that's the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency, because those two entities regulate water and water quality, and they regulate hunting, fishing, and gathering, and that is where our, our rights meet their rights, but they're not in common. And because they're not in common, my understanding under property law means they need our consent. They've been operating without our consent, but that's the real issue that all of us are looking for in Indian country is how can you just come in here and pollute our stuff and then head out of town and make money at some other location. And that's what the pipeline does. You know, we've had big spills here in northern Minnesota. The, the largest inland oil spill in North America happened in Grand Rapids, Minnesota, about 25 miles east of here in 1991. You know, 2002, we had another uh, pipeline rupture about 10 miles east of here and they burned it off and that caused a different kind of pollution as well. You know, they had a, a refine, not a refinery, but a facility explosion up in Clearbrook. And that's where uh, I'll talk about the aquifer breach here in a while, but that killed a couple of people. And just at the Husky refinery a couple of years ago, that place went up in smoke and, and that was, that was terrible to watch on TV. Enbridge didn't, didn't um, own the fire, I guess, but they were giving it all the fuel they needed you know, because that's who delivered all of that, that oil. So when we look at what we're trying to do and the rights of nature, it's, it's logical in a native community because of our link psychologically, if you want to call it that, um, mentally to the environment. We understand that we have a relationship. We're always taught that we have this relationship and how to, how to do certain things. You don't just kill something. If you're gonna kill it, well, this is how you clean it. This is how you skin it so you can tan the hide. These are the parts that you save. And if you're not gonna eat this part, well, then maybe it's bait for something else or food for something else, but there isn't a matter of just that one step. There's a process for everything. And those, those things are what is important with our group because we have what we call a clan system. And that's, that's all the way across our territory. And in Ojibwe, even where you are, <clears throat> They probably don't get out so much that way, but coming through the Great Lakes, they estimated that the Ojibwe were a territory approximately 800 miles across and 1,000 miles north and south, all the way up into Hudson Bay. 
you know, that's huge. That is huge. And you think about the cold environment and different kinds of things and the kind of estuaries and resources that are there. Ironically also, or maybe ironically is not the right word, but three of the four watersheds of North America meet in Hibbing, probably an hour east of me. And so in a sense, we have a responsibility to not let our water be degraded for everybody who's downstream, because why would we do that to somebody else? We have a responsibility to keep that water in good shape so that the fish can still pass and come up and go and, and migrate and, and do what they need to do to make more fish. Now I say that, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna deviate for just a little bit, and you've probably heard the news already just south of you there, but uh, a buddy of mine, Jack Finder, an attorney with the Sauk Seattle, he's just filed litigation in tribal court you know, using the rights of salmon. And Seattle is relying on three hydroelectric power dams to put all of their electricity into Seattle. And Seattle still owns the hydroelectric dam. Well, you know, we're talking about a whole bunch of property law right there. And we're talking about unjust taking and violations of Supreme Court case law because the salmon won on the culverts case. And you can call it a culvert and you can call it a dam, but it's the same thing. It's impeding the salmon's ability and right to migrate back to where the, those, those tribal members agreed to live at the time of the treaty, expecting at the time of the treaty that there would be water flow and that the salmon would always be there. And sure, we can hang out here because it won't be a problem. Well, right, until you cut off all the fish, you know, that's huge. And so in many ways, I think that case is a lot more obvious it's you know my case my case with the monoman is essential i think because it wild rice is a treaty right it's recognized that way for u.s case law i think it, what jack's doing with rights of salmon is the template because fish are almost everywhere and people people can use that law almost everywhere we all know what fish look like alive we know what they look like when they're dead we know what a thousand of them look like on the shore or up on the water surface so fish are a barometer that everybody can see and that's what i like about wild rice except not everybody even knows what wild rice looks like when it's growing but it's a barometer in the environment fish is definitely a barometer in the environment and so i think between that the city of Seattle being a municipal or, um, um, organization um, under the state itself, so it's a lesser kind of a entity. I think I think there's going to be something that's going to give way on that a lot faster than what I'm doing, and I think there's going to be more. I'm 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 really interested in what's going on. I think it's going to work in other places. I I'm excited about this. I'm more excited about the rights of fish almost because I'm glad to see movement and progress where other people can see how to apply this. And, you know, Jack, Jack did that to kind of surprise me. You know, he, he sent it over and let me know that he did it, you know, because he had, he had been looking for something to trigger what he was thinking and right to Monoma did that for him. Excellent. Thank you very much, Frank. It was really interesting. I over here on in Saanich, we have um, Vancouver Island treaties or Douglas treaties or Fort Victoria treaties are called, which is pretty rare for British Columbia. So, um, and which protects the right to fish as formally and to hunt as formally. So I find that really interesting as well as you're, you're reminding us to think about the white on the paper as opposed to the black ink. Uh, another important, important shift. So that was, that was very interesting. Aishka, thank you very much for, for sharing. Sure. Uh, uh, I'll move on to uh, introduce our, our next speaker as well. So next we will be having uh, Caitlin Mitchell joining us uh, next. Caitlin is a staff lawyer at Animal Justice, which is Canada's leading national animal law charity. At Animal Justice, she works to strengthen legal protections for animals and goes to court to defend the rights of animals and animal protection advoc advocates. Before joining Animal Justice, Caitlin practiced public interest environmental law for over a decade. Her environmental law practice focused on promoting legal recognition of environmental rights and advancing the cause of environmental justice in Canada. Caitlin has appeared before numerous courts across the country, including the Supreme Court of Canada. She graduated from Dalhousie University Law School in 2007 
And uh, we're very thankful to have Caitlin join us today and to share about the work she's doing. So thank you for being here. And with that, I'll, I'll pass it over to you, Caitlin. Great, thank you so much for having me. Um, I'm going to share my screen now, and I did practice this beforehand, so hopefully it's it's viewable there. Can you see my screen okay? Awesome. So um, I thought that what I would do today uh, would be to start by looking at trends around the world in terms of recognizing rights of animals and rights of nature, um, and then take that context and, and kind of turn our view to here at home in Canada and look at you know, what I'm doing and what others are doing in Canada in terms of um, advancing rights of animals and rights of nature. So to start, I'd say that um, at the most basic level, when we think about legal recognition of animal rights, you know, many of us think about endangered species laws um, and animal cruelty laws. So endangered species laws began to be enacted in the 1970s. And, you know, again, at a very high level, what they do is really recognize that species have certain rights, most notably the right not to be extinct. So that's a, that's a pretty basic right, but really the idea that species other than humans have intrinsic value really was a radical legal change at the time. And some national constitutions even safeguard rights of species from extinctions or from extinction, I should say. Um, and so we also have animal protection laws or animal cruelty laws, and those are framed in a number of ways, but generally what they do is they protect animals from certain types of harm. So they're not really rights legislation in the sense that we would think necessarily of rights legislation, but you know they do imply that animals have some sort of basic rights to be free from certain, and I would say very, very narrowly limited types of harm. So endangered species laws and animal protection laws, uh, they've proven beneficial in many ways, um, both in Canada, around the world as well. Um, but, you know, they haven't really addressed, I would say, the root causes of industrialized and legalized harm to animals, or of course, our global ecological crisis. So they've served as a tool in some instances, but you know, the system hasn't changed animals and ecosystems. You know, when we're talking again, you know, I'm, I'm obviously speaking here as someone who's called to the bar in Canada, talking about a very European focused uh, legal lens. But in that context, you know, animals and ecosystems are still very much viewed as property to be used and exploited by humans. So um, around the world, though, we're starting to see some really exciting developments um, and seeing governments and courts recognize that some sentient animals have at least some rights and ought to be protected by law. Uh, so, you know, in India, Pakistan, Argentina, and other countries, we've seen animals granted legal rights. Um, and in some places, we've even seen uh, legal personhood extended to animals. So this photo is of Sandra, who is an orangutan. She was held for about 25 years at the Buenos Aires Zoo, but in a landmark ruling in 2015, a judge in Argentina granted her legal personhood. And at a very high level, uh, what the judge found is that non-human persons like Sandra were entitled to some basic legal rights. And that includes the right to better living conditions in Sandra's case. So this decision made headlines around the world. Um, it's not the only one of its kind. Um, and since this time, Sandra has been moved to a sanctuary in Florida. And similarly, in 2020, the Islamabad High Court recognized that animals have legal rights and are entitled to protection under that country's constitution in a case that focused on a number of animals, including an elephant named Kavan. Um, and it's a really interesting decision. I do recommend reading it. And it starts with like a very long um, and sort of philosophical take on the COVID-19 pandemic and how we are now recognizing that animal and environmental and human health is interrelated. Um, so it's a really interesting decision. Um, and again, in that case, you know, the judge um, really didn't limit his um, his ruling to necessarily the interests of the animals at stake in that case. It was a very broadly worded um, decision talking about the rights of animals in general. 
And, you know, turning a little closer to home, um, we've also seen some really interesting trends internationally around habeas corpus litigation on behalf of animals. And that includes most notably cases that are being brought by the Non-Human Rights Project in the United States. So in these suits, um, what the group has done essentially is argue for the recognition of legal personhood and a right to bodily liberty and individual or of individual great apes um, and dolphins, and elephants um, held in captivity. And a writ of habeas corpus is generally something that's used to bring a detained person before the court to determine whether or not their imprisonment or detention is lawful. So in these cases, uh, the Non-Human Rights Project and, this, and other lawyers around the world have, have also taken a similar route have argued that you know, the courts should inquire as to whether the detention of, in this case, Happy the Elephant, who is featured here, um, is or is not lawful. And so, so far the non-human rights project cases in the United States have not, uh, they, haven't, they haven't been successful at achieving that outcome, but they did see um, a really exciting development recently when the New York Court of Appeals agreed to decide and to hear the issue of whether Happy the Elephant, again, that's, that's the elephant pictured here, who's held at the Bronx Zoo, whether she should get uh, human-like rights and be moved to a sanctuary. And another really interesting development in the United States involves, uh, and this is, a, <laughs> this is not a phrase that until very recently I'd heard, but uh, cocaine hippos. These are the hippos pictured here. Um, and to just explain why they are commonly called that, these are the hippos who are the offspring of hippos who were um, illegally imported into the country um, by Pablo Escobar. So um, they live in Colombia. And what happened here was basically just like a, a really interesting procedural case. So um, attorneys for the Animal Legal Defense Fund in the US asked a district court to give uh, interested persons status to these hippos so that some wildlife experts in the United States could be deposed in a case that's going on in Colombia having to do with um, the interests of the hippos and how best to sterilize the animals. So the argument was a very narrow one. It was about a federal law in the United States that allows anyone who's an interested person in a foreign jurisdiction to make depositions in the US. So it's, it's very narrow in that sense, but I would say um, that it's a pretty major milestone nonetheless to have the US justice system grant animals personhood status. Um, it's the first time that it's happened. So we have these, uh, instances where when we've seen individual animals granted personhood. Um, and another trend that I would note around the world is this trend toward recognizing environmental rights. And this is a map here that shows countries, and it's old, it's 2009, countries that have um, environmental protection provisions in their constitution, the United States and Canada, notably not on there. Um, and one form of environmental rights is uh, also rights of nature, which of course we're talking about today. Um, so some countries, and I think this has been the topic of past webinars, so I don't need to get into detail about the international side of things, but you know, some countries have recognized rights of nature in their constitutions. Others, like Bolivia, have recognized rights of nature in statutory laws. And in other countries still, um, rights of nature have been recognized through the hard work of uh, indigenous communities who have negotiated new treaties with governments for instance, uh, on the screen here um, is uh, Maori peoples in New Zealand who successfully have now had the rights of the Rangonui River um, recognized um, and specifically it's recognized as having the legal rights of a person in that country. So there are all sorts of forms that um, rights of nature have taken around the world, um, but, you know, and, and it's varying, of course, but um, I think what they have in common is that, you know, there's this, this fundamental element of many indigenous laws and worldviews, uh, and again, you know, I, I certainly don't want to generalize, but it's a common element of many, um, that there's this notion of a living earth with a set of rights and responsibilities that govern our relationships between uh, humans and the natural world. And in countries where we have statutory or constitutional recognition of environmental rights or of rights to, or duties to protect nature, we've seen some really interesting court decisions as well. 
And this is one um, example from a 2013 decision by India Supreme Court. Um, and in India, the constitution imposes a fundamental duty on all citizens to protect and improve the natural environment, including wildlife. It also includes duties on government. Um, so in this case, what I think is really interesting is that the, the court, when faced with a question about whether to relocate Asiatic lions, took a very um, ecocentric, as the court termed it, view of the matter. So they looked at it from the interests of the lions themselves. What is in their best interests in terms of whether or not um, they should be moved? And they critiqued this very anthropocentric nature of, of human development, you know, which sees the interests of nature and animals as coming, of course, secondary to human interests. So I think it's it's an interesting case and it just kind of shows what can happen when we have laws that recognize the rights and interests of nature or of other animals. So we have really exciting developments around the world, but um, you know, we, we know that right now we're facing a global ecological crisis. Um, we still have more animals killed, captured and exploited than any time uh, in history. So there's still a lot that needs to be done, but I think that these are nonetheless some really exciting trends that we should watch and also think about how to incorporate in Canada. So turning to Canada, um, what we have on the whole here when we talk about animal laws is like a very welfareist regime. We have animal protection laws that you know, protect animals from generally it's worded as like unnecessary suffering, but it's very much you know, about animals still being human property, animals still being ours to own and to use for various purposes, including entertainment, um, and just setting some limits on what types of things we can do to the animals. Our constitution is silent uh, when it comes both to the environment and to animals. And uh, so far, there's no Canadian precedent for recognizing legal personhood of animals or nature. Uh, but I think there's still some reasons to be hopeful. Uh, we do have laws and court decisions that are increasingly recognizing our moral duty toward non-human animals and the environment and recognizing that animals are more than just property. We do have shifting public opinions when it comes to the importance of both animals and the environment and our relationships with both of them. Um, and we also do have significant public support for environmental rights here in Canada. Um, and that includes rights of nature, um, where something like 80% of Canadians would support seeing rights of nature enshrined in our constitution. So we still have some really um, important tools here for, for progress. So some recent developments I think are really interesting, um, particularly at the national level. Back in 2019, we saw the enactment of Bill S-203, or what's commonly called the Free Willy Law. And what Bill S-203 did is it um, prohibited the keeping of cetaceans in captivity. It grandfathered in existing whales and dolphins, but it said, you know, no more. We're not going to continue to import these animals and keep them in tanks in Canada. So it was a really exciting first step, and it was followed up um, by the introduction of the Jane Goodall Act, um, in which was also known as Bill S-218, uh, toward the end of 2020. And here you see Jane Goodall pictured with uh, then Senator Murray Sinclair, who um, introduced the bill in the Senate at the time. And that is a really exciting law as well um, that would prohibit the keeping of great apes and lions in captivity. Um, and it could also give animals a voice in certain court proceedings so that their interests are actually heard and considered by the court. And particularly relevant for today's discussion, as well as the preamble to Bill S-218, which incorporates this notion of all my relations and talks about indigenous understandings of the internet connectedness and interdependence of human and non-human animals. Um, so, you know, unfortunately with the, the recent election, Bill uh, S-218 was not passed before then, but if and when it is introduced, uh, we and hopefully many others will be working hard to support the bill and to see its passage into law in Canada. And I think that it would be a really important step um, for a number of reasons. So we don't have habeas corpus litigation yet in Canada, like I talked about in the United States. Um, and I, I would hazard to say we're not amending our constitution in the near term, um, but I do think that we can still work to support statutory recognition of laws that reflect the rights of nature and reflect the rights of animals like the Jane Goodall Act. 
Um, and we can also engage in litigation that encourages the development and application of laws that do include rights of protection for animals. Um, and I would say standing has been a, a real challenge in Canada. Standing is, is basically the law that decides who can go to court on whose behalf. Um, and when it comes to animals, you need an organization or a human to be granted standing to bring the case forward. And that's been a real challenge here in Canada. Um, but just last week, I was in the Supreme Court of Canada on a case having to do with this interest, a public interest standing. So I'm hoping that the law of public interest standing will really continue to develop in a way that enables animals and nature in future cases um, to have their interests considered by Canadian courts. And so, you know, looking at all the, the tools around the world, I, you know, I said we don't have habeas corpus legislation yet, we're not amending our constitution yet, but I do think the rights of nature in particular is a really, really exciting and promising tool for um, animals in Canada. And I think it's promising for a number of reasons, I've summarized them here, um, but in the interest of time, I'll just mention that I think not only could recognizing rights of nature in Canada have direct impacts for animals in the environment, I think it could also make the public, courts, governments more comfortable with the concept that non-human animals can have rights. And so in that sense, I, I tend to use this term gateway right. I'm hoping that it could be also a gateway right to consider the interests of other animals as well. You know, if, if an ungulate in the form of a caribou has rights, why not an ungulate also in the form of a cow, for instance? And I would also say that recognizing uh, rights of nature is also a really exciting opportunity to bring Canadian laws um, more in line with Indigenous laws and cultural values, which is something that I think we need to be working toward um, more generally, and certainly something that former Senator Marie Sinclair has discussed at length. Um, and recognize really that you know animals are sentient beings and this interconnectedness between environmental health, human health and animal health and the need to reflect that in our um, Canadian laws. So in conclusion, you know, each time we, we think about these things and we think about animal rights and every time we talk about extending rights to previously rightsless entities, it of course seems um, unthinkable and it, and it has throughout history, that's the trend. And we also know from other civil rights movements like indigenous rights, women's rights, um, civil rights movements in the United States that rights are not a magic tool, of course, that will fix everything for animals, but they are a very powerful and symbolic um, tool that can be used and that can be uh, used, I think, to achieve real progress. So we have a long way to go in Canada. But um, again, I do think there's reason to be optimistic. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much for that, Caitlin. Um, I particularly appreciate the sort of survey of different examples around the world and then bringing it back to some of the um, examples here in Canada as well. I know that we have, we'll have people joining us from all around the world today. Um, so I'm sure that that's greatly appreciated in the audience as well. Um, as well as some of the reflections that has me thinking, being from Sandwich and some of the, the islands in behind us, I, you know, I'm often thinking of our stories, how this line between animals or species and humans is not so, not so clear in many Indigenous traditions. We have stories where one is often transformed into the other, um, quite literally, um, Senate ancestors at various times. Um, so I find that very interesting to think about as well. So thank you very much for that. Um, also, we have uh, one more speaker. Our final speaker who will be joining us today is Kurt Russo. Uh, Dr. Russo has worked with Indigenous communities since 1978 in the areas of sacred site protection, Indigenous treaty rights, environmental cross-cultural conflict resolution, and the intertextualization of ways of knowing nature. He was co-founder and executive director of the Florence R. Clacone Center for the Study of Values and Native American Land Conservancy. He helped establish the International Indigenous Exchange Program for the Northwest Indian College, the Sacred Lands Conservancy, and the Foundation for Indigenous Medicine. He is executive director of Cicely, uh, Indigenous-led non-profit dedicated to the perpetuation of practical application of Indigenous ancestral knowledge. And he has a Bachelor of Science in Forestry from the University of Montana, a Master's of Science in Forestry from the University of Washington, 
and a PhD in history from the University of California, Riverside. He is a veteran and served in the Vietnam War where he worked with Montegard indigenous communities. And we're very fortunate to have Kurt join us today to speak about his work with indigenous communities to protect Salish Sea orcas or Kholmachin. Uh, so Hajka for being with us and I'll turn it over to you. Thank you. I, uh, <clears throat> I want to mention that I am speaking today from the uh, Lactamish People's Territory, Northwest Washington State, the Lummi Indians near Bellingham. I uh, want to also mention that everything I'm about to say was cleared with my board of directors. We have an all indigenous board of directors. They wanted me to say a few things to you today. I want to put my hands out to Winona LaDuke, Frank. We were in your territory with the totem pole last July, the Red Road totem pole to DC. Um, we came there to stand with you and beside you in your fight. Our hands out to your work. And Caitlin, thank you so much for your information. That was really useful for our fight. My presentation today will, will be three parts. One part is about Scarlet. One part is about Scalicia. One part is about Tokatai. Some years back, the Lummi Indians were asked by the federal government to help them feed, help them feed a dying orca. What you see in front of you is the Lummi Nation's law enforcement boat. It's a feeding platform. We are trying to find Scarlet to feed her. She was dying of starvation in the Salish Sea. I bring her up because something happened that day that has a lot to do where science, law, and ceremony are swimming in the same water. We couldn't find the L-pod, probably the J-pod anywhere. So the chief of the Lummi Nation asked everybody on that boat to get in the cabin and face forward. And so that's what we did. And then he was asked if we could come out. And we came out to find four dorsals beside the boat. We see in front of you is the J-pod. On the other side of the boat was Scarlet. We put a salmon right on her nose. Ceremony brought these dorsals to the surface. Not law, not politics, ceremony. Well, she died. And she died because the National Oceanographic and the National Oceanographic and Atmospheric Administration that's in charge of the orcas, hello, in the Department of Commerce. <laughs> Their big decider in DC went on vacation. So we couldn't do anything. And she died. Which uh, brought up the question of moral authority. The moral authority of a nation, an indigenous nation, with a 25,000 year history of relationship to these beings had to stand down and let a relative die. You can put the next picture up there, Stephen. There was a moment in the Salish Sea when Lummi Fisher and his partner were in their boat setting net. And the young woman said, look, look at the blood. There's blood in the water. They looked down to see afterbirth strike their boat. Moments later, this big dorsal appeared with a baby giving its first breath. That's when you see that little bubble. To the Lummi cosmological view, that was a relative showing their child, bringing healing from the death of Scarlet. After this experience, the Lummi nation decided we're gonna go out and feed the orcas. Oh, that's against the law. So the Lummi Nation, in their law enforcement boat, went out into the Salish Sea with live kings. And they put live kings in the water to feed the spirit of Scalicia. Scalicia is the name of the southern residents. Scalicia. Next picture, please. We were told, we were told in the Sovereignty and Treaty Protection Office with whom I was at the time, you cannot continue to do that. 
You cannot try to feed the orcas. You'll domesticate them. We could only laugh at that, of course. But what we said back was, by what moral authority do you say this? Don't give us law. Give us your moral authority. Where do you get your moral authority to tell indigenous peoples that the sailors see they can't feed their relatives? Well, you know, they didn't have an answer. Instead, they said, well, a couple weeks later, let us know how we can help. Now, I'm going to say the one last part of my presentation, which there's a lot to these stories, is about Tokitai. Tokitai was captured in 1970 in a massive capture in Penn Cove that eviscerated the southern resident killer whale population, decimated it. Of all the whales captured that day, Tokatai is the only one living alive today. She's the only one left in an 80 foot wide tank, 20 feet deep in Miami. She's a member of the L pod, the L pod of the Southern residents, Scalicha. The Lummies gave her her name, Scalichaktanat is her name. And the Lummi Indians have called repeatedly for her to be returned. Two Lummi matriarchs, two amazingly courageous women, have filed a lawsuit under NAGPRA, the Native American Graves and Repatriation Act, to have her returned. That case is pending. The Earth Law Center is handling it. And the authors of NAGPRA, with whom we worked, said, funny thing about NAGPRA, it doesn't say it is limited to non-living things. There seems to be a hole through which a killer whale can swim. The argument is NAGPRA applies anytime you can prove cultural affinity, cultural patrimony, she is an object in quotes. She is a person. I believe, Caitlin, you mentioned this. In Lummi cosmology, in Lummi worldview, orcas are called kualalmachin. Kualalmachin means the people that live under the waves. This is a very ancient logical cosmological order with, I should say, they call a perspicuous order. It hasn't been made up for the convenience of the court. It is an established cosmological view. You trace back to, I believe, I believe Robert was mentioning a transformer, the transformative nature of Salish cosmology, Lummi cosmology, of course, the transformation, the transformer, pals, is a, it's not a legend. It's not a mythology. It's a worldview that the, the women that are filing this case are saying, we have an inherent right we never gave away. We reserved the right to our worldview. And in our worldview, Southern resident killer whales are the equivalent of persons. That is the basis of the case under NAGPRA. She is a person of cultural affinity and cultural patrimony. You know, we've been witness to a lot of different things. This image you see in front of you here, that's a killer whale. That was a canoe race. That was a night shot. That killer whale surfaced out of nowhere. And they did ceremony. They laid their hands on that being as a relative. I'm reading some things right now about language games. Law is a language game. 
with its predicates, its predispositions and its paradigms, none of which is impartial. The Niagara case that these two matriarchs from the Sacred Lands Conservancy and the Earth Law Center, they're standing upon an inherent right, an inherent right to be in relation to their kins who are persons to not only feed them, but to have them returned. And if the case is won, by the way, this killer whale that's been in captivity over 50 years, she still sings her song at night, every night. And she recognizes her dialect. And her mother is still alive. She's the matriarch of Elpa. And I stand with great honor with a, a tribal community that has the courage of these convictions to say, we don't care about your predicates, your predispositions and your paradigm. She is a person. Don't give us back the language game of law. She's a person. And every year we do a journey on her behalf. I uh, want to answer one question I happened to see. A question someone asked about how can non-native groups weigh in on these kinds of things. In 2018, the Lummi Nation did a totem pole journey dedicated to Tokatai. The Scali a 4,000 mile journey, went straight to Miami with a totem pole carved on her behalf. And non Indian groups and organizations supported that effort all along the way. And it was hugely important. I'll share with you a moment when Fred Lane, a Lummi Indian, was looking at his relative in this chlorinated tank on the hot Miami sun held there by a law that has no conscience, but it's about to get one. And he stood beside that tank. And she was across the tank looking away from him. And he stood there with his, he had his red paint on, he's a painted person. And he just slowly sang this song and she came over, turned around, swam over to him and just hung in the water below him. It is not a matter of theory. It's a matter of fact that there are different worldviews at play in the world today. And the worldview, the cosmological inherent order that goes from the transformer Hal straight through to Kuala as a person is unmistakable. Can we get a court of law to appreciate that? in the court of the conqueror? Let's keep that in mind here, whose court we're talking about. But I do believe that spirit works in miraculous ways on these things. I believe she'll come home. And I believe one other thing about her coming home. It will be a transformative moment for the Salish Sea. It will re-enchant the worldview that has been sterilized by science, sterilized by modernism, sterilized and re-enchanted with indigenous knowledge. Thank you. Excellent, thank you very much, Kurt. Um, being that Lummies are our, our relatives and our neighbors just to that side of the border, there's obviously a lot of um, close connection with uh, Tales and some of the teachings that I know from Senish. So appreciate you sharing that. And um, thank you to all of our, our guests very much. Uh, I do note that we are at 1.30 now. So um, I'm just going to have the opportunity to raise just one question. We also had one, one answered there. So um, I'll go with the one first one up. So 
uh, I could pose this to all of the all of the panelists, and then after that we'll uh, close out. So thank you for everyone for joining us. But uh, the question here is: uh, the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples refers to free, prior, and informed consent. What does free, prior, and informed consent mean to you in the context of the rights of nature issue? Um, so I, I will open it up to our three guests, and I guess feel free to jump in if you you would like to uh, pose an answer to that. All right. So free, free prior informed consent to me is the same thing as our treaty rights. And, and that is one of the two things that I think are missing from our water rights struggles in, in Indian country. We don't, we don't have the requirement of consent yet, which means people just do whatever they want and we have a hard time stopping them in their courts, our courts, state courts, federal courts, world courts, I mean, you can go down the line. And then the other part is abundant quality water. And there isn't very much dicta on this in any of these court cases, but we're very close to it. And I'm hoping that the rights of monoman is one of those cases that does that. Because one of the problems about law and trying to figure out where to go, you know, because you got to look at some of the black on the pages, is, you know, what can you do and where can you go and do it? And so, you know, that's that's the other half of what's happening there. I, I, I remain excited. I'm, I'm very glad to have participated today. I think that um, all of this, what, you know, what <clears throat> Kurt was just talking about there, the relationship with other uh, creatures and things like that, it seems hard to believe it could still exist in 2022. It's going to exist in 3022. That's the problem people don't understand. So, miigwech. Then would you, Kurt or Caitlin, would you like any final comments on that? that question before we, we close up? Yeah, I, one thing I would like to say, I'm not sure, again, I'm not a lawyer, so I don't know that it matters. I mean, when she was captured, speaking of Tokatai, in 1970, nobody came to any of the tribes and said, do you mind if we capture half the, half the Southern residents? There was no, now, there are so many cases like that, uh, Frank, that things get taken out of the territory and no one, no one asks permission. And I think the idea of free prior informed consent, I mentioned this totem pole journey, we brought, brought to your territory. That was one of the mantras of that whole journey is a demand for FBI. I don't know if it'll make any difference, but I think it's an important principle for sure. Excellent. Well, thank you again very much, um, Aish Kahela. And uh, any final words from you, Stefan, or is that uh, great? Well, thank you everyone for joining us today and um, that's all for us, so Aishka. All right, miigwech. Aishka.